important to all of us. The sights, sounds, smells, the beloved traditions, they have all shaped our perspective on this most loved holiday. This is the time of year when people spend more time with family, take more time to decorate, feel more nostalgic, and act more sentimental. This is the time of year when people think more about the needs of others and actually give more to help meet those needs. But shouldn't our perspective on the celebration of Jesus' birth be shaped more by God's word and less by the culture? Shouldn't we take the time to look at Christmas through the eyes of those who appear on the pages of the Bible, those who are actually a part of the story? I think that would change our lives forever. Well, today we're going to be wrapping up our Christmas series that we have been in over the last several weeks called Christmas in Perspective. And today we're going to be wrapping it up looking at Christmas from our perspective. And so I want to invite you to uh, find your place in Luke chapter number one uh, to let you know where we're going to be at today, Luke chapter one. And as you're you're turning there, uh, I just want to kind of recap where we've been over the last few weeks. And so each week we have looked at Christmas from a different perspective of someone in Scripture. Uh, We have looked at Christmas from God's perspective, the shepherd's perspective. Uh, We looked at Christmas last week from Jesus' perspective. And this week we're going to wrap it up with looking at Christmas from our perspective. Uh, And I want to ask you a question as, as we think about Uh, Christmas from our perspective. Has anyone here ever, or watching online, have you ever tried to to find something in the dark? You walked into a room, and maybe you didn't flip the light on. It was dark, and you just thought, well, I'm going to go in here really quick. I'm going to try to find it. And you're kind of feeling around in the dark, trying to find something. And when you do that, it it doesn't work out too well most of the time. We're just kind of like trying to figure out where things are, where we are. Maybe you get up in the middle of the night, and you're trying to to walk to the bathroom or you're trying to walk to the kitchen or something and, it, and it's dark and you're kind of feeling your way, you know, for the walls to, to not run into anything. But that doesn't necessarily always work out very well for us uh, when we try to find our way in the dark. Also, think about this. Could you imagine trying to drive at night in the dark with no lights on? And I don't know if Martinsville is the way Danville is, but in Danville we have a lot of people that are just stupid and decide they want to drive with no headlights on. And I have no idea how they can see anything about where they're going. Uh, in fact, I, you can't even hardly see them. But imagine, you know, if you were trying to drive down 220 at night without any headlights on. That would be pretty difficult to do. In fact, I, I don't think you would make it very far before you ran into something or you ran off the road. I don't think that would go very well for us at all. And darkness is, is something that uh, Scripture talks about uh, spiritually, and uh, even talks about physical darkness as well. And there's a book uh, by author uh, Joan Chittister called Between the Dark and the Daylight. And here's what she says in that book. It says, psychologists tell us that one of the most difficult conditions a person can be forced to bear is light deprivation. Darkness, in fact, is often used in military captivity or penal institutions to break down an individual's sense of self. Once a person becomes disoriented, once they lose uh, a sense of where they are and what it is that lurks in the dark around them, or where the next uh, crevice or wall or attack may be coming from, once they can no longer feel in control of their physical surroundings, a person loses sense of self. Every shred of self-confidence shrivels. The giant within them falls and they become whimpering prey of the unknown. The natural instinct is to be combative, uh, to be combative, I'm sorry, the natural instinct instinct to be combative is paralyzed by fear. The spirit of resistance weakens. The prisoner becomes more pliable, more submissive, more willing to take directions. It disarms a person. This fall, the fail, or excuse me, this fall into the sinkhole of sensory deprivation. It can drive them to madness. It is, every military knows, an effective technique. Nothing does more than darkness to isolate us from the sense of human support and understanding, which, whether we're commonly conscious of it or not, excuse me, is the human being's main source of self-definition. Indeed, darkness separates us from reality. 
it disorients a person both physically and psychologically. And that's important for us to understand when we think about darkness and we think about light. See, darkness causes fear. Many of you probably can remember, maybe even as a child, being afraid of the dark. Uh, Darkness, you know, you don't know what's there. You can't see what is there. And so it's a fear of the unknown. But darkness causes us to fear. Darkness isolates us. In fact, if you're in darkness, you can't see your surroundings. You feel like you are all alone because you see just in your immediate area, if, if even that. But darkness also causes us not to not only to fear, not only to be isolated, <clears throat> but darkness causes us to be disoriented. In fact, when you walk into a room and it's pitch dark, you, you have no idea which way's forward, which way's sideways or backwards or up or down. It causes disorientation. And in fact, we see darkness distorts reality. Darkness distorts what we think is real and what is not real. Uh, and so that's what we're going to talk about today. When we look at Christmas from our perspective <clears throat> is how that Jesus has delivered us from darkness into light. How the light of God's word and God's truth has shown in our hearts and in our lives and has changed our perspective and, and changed how we view Christmas. So today in Luke chapter number 1, we're going to begin reading in verse 67 and we're going to read down through verse 79 just to get context of what we're going to talk about, but we're going to primarily be in verses 78 and 79 today. <clears throat> Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 67, here's what the Bible says. It says, Then his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and gave this prophecy. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and redeemed his people. He has sent us a mighty Savior from the royal line of his servant David, just as he promised through his holy prophets long ago. Now we will be saved from our enemies and from all who hate us. He has been merciful to our ancestors by remembering his sacred covenant, the covenant he swore with an oath to our ancestor Abraham. We have been rescued from our enemies so we can serve God without fear and holiness and righteousness for as long as we live. And you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High because you will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins. Because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. So we're going to talk about what it means to go from darkness to light to be in darkness, and to have the light of the truth of God's Word shine into our lives and into our hearts. And so in this text, I want to give you just a little bit of of things that are going to help you with some background on this. And in the text that we just read, Israel is portrayed as a a caravan of travelers that would be traveling um, on to a distant land that have lost their way and have been overtaken uh, by night. We see that they are stranded in utter darkness, in a lonely place of wilderness. And in fact, in in ancient times, during uh, biblical times, people did not travel at night like we do now because it would have been, number one, dangerous. Two, they wouldn't have had the means to travel at night quite like we do uh, with our technology and things. And so night travel was something that was was very difficult and and just almost impossible. And so they would have been portrayed as, as a group of people that is traveling And they've had to stop because night has overtaken them. And so they can't continue on where they were headed. It has halted their journey. In fact, it's also a picture of of not only being stranded in utter darkness in a a place of loneliness, a place of of wilderness, but it's also a picture of of apathy. It's, It's a picture of despair and a picture of hopelessness when we think about darkness. Darkness, uh, we see, is a, is a place where we, we feel like there is no hope. We, we despair, and we also see that darkness can lead us to a place of apathy, to where we have become used to the darkness, and it doesn't affect us, and we don't notice it. It's kind of like when you walk into darkness, as we said, trying to find your way in the dark room or, or getting to the bathroom or the kitchen. If you've ever noticed when you walk in from somewhere where it's bright light and you go into a room of darkness, all of a sudden it's, you're blinded, you don't see anything, but 
The longer you stay in the room, the longer that you're in darkness, your eyes begin to adjust and, and compensate for the darkness. And then you can see a little bit more. And you, can, you tend to see better the longer you're there. And so we see that it can also be a picture of, of apathy because we get used to the darkness. But then we see in this text that not only is it a picture of them being stranded in darkness in a lonely place, uh, a picture of despair and hopelessness. We see that the light breaks upon them. And, and this would be like dawn breaking. And so the caravan of travelers has had to stay overnight and, and stop where they were. And we know as we see the sun coming up over the horizon and dawn breaks, how a darkness gives way to light and we can see. And so literally what is being pictured is Christ, the light of the world, breaking through the darkness that Israel found themselves in. In fact, in the Old Testament, we see the prophet Isaiah talks about this in chapter 9, verse 2, when he says, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. And that is, is, a, is a prophecy of the coming of Jesus, the coming of the Messiah, when he's saying the people who are in darkness, they're going to see a great light. And those that are in a land of deep darkness, he's saying a light will shine, and that light is going to be Jesus. And so Christmas, from our perspective, is simply this. And we're going to break this down over the next few minutes we have together. Christmas, from our perspective, is that you and I were walking in darkness, and then the light of Jesus broke through our darkness. That is Christmas from our perspective, that you and I were walking in darkness, not knowing where we're going, not knowing what's around us, not understanding the way we should go, but yet Jesus' light broke through our darkness that we were in and has illuminated our path and has changed things forever for us. And so in our text, there's three things that I want us to deal with today and look at when we see uh, Christmas from our perspective of being delivered from darkness and brought into light. Number one, I want us to first of all notice that the birth of Christ reveals God's mercy towards you and me. The birth of Christ reveals God's mercy towards you and me. That word mercy literally means compassionate or kindly forbearance shown to an, toward an offender, an enemy, or other person in one's power. It literally means that it is withholding what is ju justly due to someone. It means that we are forbearing, we are holding off, we are showing kindness to someone who does not deserve it. It could be someone who has offended us. It even says an enemy, someone that doesn't like us, that would speak ill of us. It literally is saying that we show them kindness. That's what mercy is, compassionate or kindly forbearance that we put off, that we forbear uh, any retaliation or any ill feelings or anything toward someone who has offended us or would be considered an enemy. But yet, we, when we think about mercy, this is completely contrary to how our culture operates. This is completely 180 degrees in the opposite direction of what our culture operates as. And, and our culture doesn't even understand this way of thinking. In fact, when we think about that God's mercy has been revealed towards us in Christ, that we were not given what we deserved, that is so completely different from what our culture tells us. In fact, right now we're getting ready to celebrate Christmas within less than a week. And, and those of us who have kids uh, or maybe grandkids that are, that are still young enough, we're, you know, we're preparing uh, and, and you know, it's almost time for Santa to come and, and, and all those things and Santa Claus is a perfect example of how our culture gets this completely different than what God says. We think about this all year long. What do we do? We tell our kids, hey, you know, and even we sing songs about it that, you, you, you know, that he's, he knows when we've been bad, he knows when we've been good, that he's basically always watching us. And so we use that sometimes as a motivator for our kids. Hey, you, know, you, you better be good because Santa knows. Remember? You say, you, know, you don't want to lump a coal in your stocking for Christmas, do you? And so we would tell kids that, and, and, and as adults, we tend to approach God that way, that it's like, okay, 
Yes, God is, knows when we've been good. He knows when we're not. He knows everything about us. In fact, he knows what we're thinking. He knows the real us. And so we tell kids, hey, you know, be good because if you're good, then this is what you're going to get in return. And God doesn't work that way because if we got what we deserved in return, we would get punishment. We would get hell. We would get separation from God for eternity because that is the payment that our sin uh, is demanded by our sin. And so it's completely contrary. In fact, Titus chapter 3 verse 5 tells us that God saved us not because of the righteous things that we have done, but it says he has saved us because of his mercy. He didn't save you and he didn't save me because there was anything in us that merited him doing that. It wasn't because we deserved it. It wasn't because we were worthy. It was because of his mercy. And so the birth of Christ reveals God's mercy toward you and me. And, and I don't know about you, I'm thankful that I didn't get what I deserve. Because if I got what I deserved, I would be in hell right now paying the penalty for my sin. And if I got what I deserved, I, I, I would be eternally separated from God, but he extended his mercy through the birth of his son Jesus and, and made a way to reconcile me and reconcile you unto him. And so the birth of Jesus reveals God's mercy, which is completely different and opposite of what our culture thinks because our culture tells us that, you know, it, it basically looks at mercy as weakness. It tells us that we are to do unto others, you know, before they do unto us. Or it tells us to, to do unto them as, you know, they have done to us. And, and so our culture completely gets this wrong. And so we realize that the birth of Jesus is God's mercy toward you and me. And it reveals his mercy. See, because the, here's the thing. It's not about how good we've been. See, we tell our kids, you know, be good because of the, it's not about how good you and I have been. It's about how good God is. And that is what mercy is about. In fact, in fact, justice, when we talk about justice, we say we want justice for this or we want this person to get justice. What we're saying is justice is for those who deserve it. Mercy is for those who don't. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to get justice. I want to get mercy. I want to get what I did not deserve. And I want to get what it, God is extending to me that I was not worthy of. In fact, I love what Thomas Watson said about mercy. He says, God is more willing to pardon than punish. He says, mercy does more multiply in him than sin in us. Mercy is his nature. And I'm thankful today that because of God's mercy, he's saying that his mercy is greater than our sin. And it means it doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where we've been. It doesn't matter how dark our heart is, God's mercy is greater than our sin. In fact, mercy is the very nature of God, and it's demonstrated through the birth of Jesus. Not only do we see that the birth of Christ reveals God's mercy towards us, but secondly, the birth of Christ shines light into our darkness. The birth of Christ shines light into our darkness. And, and so for the nation of Israel, this was really important because they had went through a period of, of several hundred years to where there was no new revelation from God. In fact, it, it was kind of that, that period in between what we call the Old Testament and the New Testament. There was a period of several hundred years to where there was no new revelation. There was no God manifesting himself in the ways that he had done in years past. And so they truly were in a dark time. They were under Roman oppression and Roman rule. And Israel seemed to be not only in a spiritual darkness, but a physical darkness as well. In fact, we see that, uh, that Scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, Paul says, For God who said, Let there be light in darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of of Jesus Christ. The birth of Christ shines light into our darkness. And so there's a few ways that, that that happens. Number one, that it shows us where we truly are. 
when the light of Christ shines into our hearts and, and in our lives, we see really where we are, not only physically, but we see where we are spiritually, which is most important. When we have the light of God's word shine into our hearts and our lives, when we're reading God's word and, and God's word begins to, to show us who we really are, that that's important because it's like a mirror for us spiritually. You know, all of us, when we're getting ready in the mornings, we, we spend time in front of the mirror uh, getting ready to make sure we look acceptable, to make sure we don't, you know, uh, look bad or anything like that. But God's Word is like that mirror for us spiritually. So when we, we pick God's Word up and we begin to read through the pages of His Word, it's like a mirror and it's showing me who I really am. It's showing me what is in my heart it shows me the places uh, that, that need, to be, need to be dealt with. It shows me the blemishes on my, myself spiritually. It shows me all the things about myself that I need to see. And so the birth of Christ shines light into our darkness by showing us where we truly are. And if we're honest before the Lord today, none of us are where we truly should be with Jesus. None of us are. If we're all honest, we all fall short. And I'm afraid that too often we've, we've perpetuated this idea in, in modern day Christianity that somehow when we come to Jesus and he saves us and, and we, we come to faith in him and we have new life, that somehow we've got it all together. We don't. We are still just as much of a mess as anybody else. And Jesus is in our mess and he's working on our mess to change it for his honor and for his glory. But you and I are not perfect. And we got to quit perpetuating this idea that somehow we are or that we have arrived or that we're better or that we don't struggle with the things that, we, that people who are not believers struggle with because we do. It's a mirror for us spiritually. But not only does it show us where we truly are, but in the light of Christ that shines into our darkness, it gives you and I direction on where to go and how to get there. As we talked about earlier when we were opening up that, you know, you see people all the time driving at night with no lights on. And, and if you don't have lights to illuminate your path, it's really hard to know where you're going. It's kind of like if you're in darkness and, and you're trying to walk down a dark hallway or into a dark room, if you don't have a little bit of light, it really is difficult to figure out where you are going and, and what's around you and <clears throat> trying to make sure you're not bumping into things and, and, and running into other things. It is is a light that gives us direction, and it tells us how we are to get there. In fact, the psalmist says that the Word of God is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, meaning it illuminates the way that we're supposed to go. I love what author and uh, leadership expert John Maxwell, he says about this. He says, until I understand where I am, he says, I can't get to where I'm going. This is the value of a compass. When we are walk, out walking or hiking and need to know where we're going, and need to know, I'm sorry, need to know we're going in the right direction, he says, but we also have an internal North Star. It's that little nudge that tells us if we are on the right path to, to fulfilling our potential or on the wrong path, wasting energy, traveling somewhere we don't need to go. He says, so my advice to you is pull out that compass and make sure you are navigating in the right direction on your journey. And that's what God's word is. It is that compass that shows us where to go. It shows us how we are to live as followers of Jesus. It shows us how we are to treat others as followers of Jesus. It shows us the way of eternal life. In fact, it is our compass. It is our, our map. It's our GPS. It, it's all of those things. And it shows us exactly how we are to get where we are going. It gives us direction and it tells us how to get there. I, I always think back to thinking about you know, direction and how to get there. I, I think back to, to, to my grandpa on my, my mom's side because he liked to get out and he liked to just ride roads and figure out where they went. And, and I can remember riding with him sometimes and he'd just be like, where's this go? I don't know. We'll, we'll figure it out somewhere. And, and I think I kind of inherited that from him. I like getting out and riding around and just figuring out where stuff goes. And, and I did that the other day. I was, I was here and had left and I was on my way home. So I thought, well, I'm just going to ride out this way. I'm just going to see where this road goes. And I mean, I rode it for a long ways. I'm like, I have no idea where I'm at right now. I, I don't know. Uh, and, and I'm thinking to myself, well, eventually, I think I'm going to probably get somewhere where I know. Uh, 
And sometimes that works, sometimes that doesn't. Sometimes you, you get on another road and you're like, I have absolutely no clue where I'm at right now. Um, I could have told you I was still in the state of Virginia. I think I was still in Henry County. I'm not sure about that. But uh, <clears throat> I was somewhere. And so finally I was like, you know, I'm going to end up driving around for a long time if I don't just go ahead and punch in the GPS home. And when I did that, it told me where to go. That's kind of the way God's word is for us. It's, we can just ride around in our lives trying to figure out where to go, trying to figure out the right road to take, trying to figure out the right thing to do. And if we don't have a compass or a GPS, we're going to be, we're just going to be guessing. We're going to be, and it may work out, it may not. But God's word is that compass. It's that map, that GPS that directs us on where to go. And so we see that the, the birth of Christ, it shines light into our darkness and shows us where we are to go. It shows us who we are supposed to be and how we're supposed to live. But then the third thing about the light of, uh, of Christ shining into our darkness, it gives us hope. In fact, in Hebrews, we, we find that the author tells us that hope is called the anchor of our soul because it gives stability to us in our walk with Christ. And I love what uh, R.C. Sproul says. He says, hope is not simply a wish. He says, as I wish that such and such would take place. But rather it is that which latches on to the certainty of the promises of the future that God has made. See, the hope that the Bible talks about is not, well, you know, I, I hope this works out or I hope this comes to pass. It's not that. It is uh, literally a certainty when we say that, that Christ is the hope that anchors our soul, meaning that it's, it's a hope that we know is secure, that we don't have to say, well, I just hope this works out and pans out. No, we know for certainty. We hope in Jesus because of the promise that he has made to us. And so the light that Christ shines into our darkness, it, it tells us who we are and it, it shows us where to go, but it also gives us hope for the future. And right now, hope is a valuable commodity in our culture. We're not so different than they were over 2,000 years ago. They were living in a time when there wasn't a lot of hope. And you and I right now are, are, are facing a time when people are not really hopeful about a whole lot of things. We're, you know, we're almost two years into a pandemic, and uh, you know, we were told you know, that initially we thought like a couple weeks, and we're going to have this thing knocked out, and then it turned into a month, and then you know, it just... Let's just be honest. We're not hopeful about a lot of things. We, we, we look at the way our, our world is. We, we look at, at, at how fractured our nation is and, and how we see that you know, our, our leadership is not looking out for us. And we, we, we look at the world and we think, man, there's not a lot to be hopeful about. But the light of Christ shines into that darkness and says that even in the midst of all those things, in the midst of a pandemic, in the, in the midst of uncertainty with our future, we can have hope because our hope is anchored to Jesus and it's not anchored to our circumstances. It's not anchored to who the next president is. It's not anchored to what the Congress does. It's anchored to Jesus and what he has done for you and me. So the light of Christ shines into our darkness. But let me give you the third thing. We see not only does the birth of Christ reveal God's mercy, not only does the birth of Christ shine light into our darkness, but the third thing, the birth of Christ brings peace to our troubled hearts. The birth of Christ brings peace to our troubled hearts. Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 27, he says, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. And then he says, so don't be troubled or afraid. Jesus is getting ready to, he's telling the disciples about he's getting ready to die and he's getting ready to ascend to heaven and he's going to be leaving them. And he's letting them know. In fact, he tells them several times, he says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in, you believe in God, believe also in me. And he goes on to tell them and he says, I'm going away but I'm going to send another. I'm going to send you the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, and He is going to guide you in all things. He's going to give you peace. He's going to indwell you personally, and He's going to be with you. And, and think about this for a moment. The, we romanticize the, the 12 disciples and, and how they got to be with Jesus for three and a half years, 
But you and I have something far greater because when Jesus was ascended and when he was crucified on the cross and, and he died and then he ascended into heaven, when Jesus died on the cross, they, they thought it was over. They thought that was it. And, and a lot of them were like, man, we, we thought he was the Messiah, the one that was going to redeem and deliver Israel. And he was taken from them. But you and I have the presence of the Holy Spirit and he is never away from us. He can never be taken from us once we come to faith in, tr- in, in Christ. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within us, and they didn't have that. They didn't understand that. And you and I have something amazing, and he says that it's a peace of mind and heart, and it's a peace that is a gift that the world cannot give to you and me. See, the world is looking for peace. They are seeking peace, but the world's peace is an intermittent peace. It ebbs and flows, it comes and goes, because why? It's based on circumstances, and it is based on how things are at the moment. And and the peace that Jesus brings to us is totally different. In fact, we see that that it is constant. It, It is, why is it constant? Because Jesus is constant. Jesus is the anchor of our soul. And so the world's peace is intermittent. And he's saying, I'm giving you a peace that the world cannot give. And so I want you to understand this, that the peace that God gives, and and too often we confuse this, so I want you to really get this, is the peace that God gives you and me is not the absence of conflict or trouble, but it is the assurance that he is with us in the midst of the conflict and the trouble. I want to say that again. The peace that God gives us is not the absence of conflict and trouble, but it is the assurance that he is with us in the midst of of the conflict and trouble. I think we kind of confuse that too often in our, in our faith and in Christianity. We, we try to make peace to be something that come to faith in Jesus and he's going to give you peace and, and, and all's going to be well. And, and it's going to be roses and, and calm seas and, and everything's going to be great. And that's not what the Christian life is. In fact, we're going to struggle. We're going to have our ups and downs. We're going to have, uh, have our, our doubts and our worries and our fears. But here's the thing, we can still have peace in the midst of uncertainty. Why? Because our peace is not tethered to the circumstances. Our peace is anchored in the hope of Jesus and what he has done. And not only what he's done, that he's coming again. And and so that is the peace that God gives. It's not the absence of conflict or, or trouble, but it is the assurance that he is with you and me in the midst of the trouble. I want to ask you, if you have your Bible, to to look at Psalm 23 for for just a moment. If you don't, we're going to have it on the screen. But Psalm 23, I just want to read that as we we prepare to to close out. Psalm 23, let me get there. And I want you to think about this as we think about peace. This is probably the most quoted passage of Scripture, probably in all of God's Word as far as like a, a big chunk or a passage. And here's what Psalm 23 says. It says, The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in the green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff Protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. So notice something in that passage when David is penning these words. He says, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. And he says that, he tells the Lord, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And then he says that you have prepared a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. Or as some translations say, you have prepared a table for me in the midst of my enemies. So, meaning that he has prepared a feast. And and this is something, this would be, a feast is something we do when we celebrate. It's something that's a joyous occasion. It's something that is a happy time. It's something that... Is, is, some, is, is something we look forward to. And he's saying that in the midst 
of my enemies, in the midst of my troubles and all these things, God, you have prepared a table and you have prepared a feast and I can rejoice in the midst of a dark valley. I can have joy in the midst of, of, of troubled times when enemies surround me. I can have joy and I can have peace because the peace is not about the circumstances, but the peace is tied to the one that is the shepherd. And I want to say this as we close. The Bible is full of accounts of God meeting people in their darkness. The Bible is full of accounts of God meeting people in their darkness and shining the light of his truth into that darkness and who he is in their hearts. Just a few examples. It was in the darkness of a dungeon that Joseph received uh, the commission from God and he became a government official in the land of Egypt. It was in dark, the darkness of the fish that Jonah reconciled with God and became a missionary to the Ninevites to proclaim God's forgiveness. It was in darkness that, of the lion's den that Daniel recognized God as the king who would shut the mouths of the lions and protect him. It was in the darkness of the tomb that Lazarus was resurrected and became an example of what new life in Jesus looks like. It was in the darkness of blinded eyes that Paul resolved to live a life for Christ and became a, one of the greatest fathers of the early church and is responsible for the majority of the New Testament. And it's through the darkness of death ultimately that Jesus rose to rescue humanity and reign as the Savior of the world. And so I just want us to leave today seeing that Christmas from our perspective is about us being in darkness and Jesus breaking through that darkness to shine the light of who he is into that darkness and he shattered our darkness. And so I want to ask you a question as we prepare to, to respond and, and we prepare to, to sing and worship together. What area of your life or what areas of your life right now do you need the light of God's truth to shine into? Do you need the truth of God's light to shine into to your heart because maybe you're not a follower of Jesus and you've never placed your faith and trust in Him and you need to have a relationship with Christ? Maybe you need right now God's light to shine into your heart and the truth of God's Word to, to break through the darkness. And you need to come to the place that you receive what Jesus has done for you. And by repentance and faith, you turn from your sin and place your faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus on the cross, believing that that was sufficient enough to pay the debt that your sin demands. Maybe right now in your life, you need the light of God's truth to shine into, uh, into your life for direction. Maybe you're struggling with where your life needs to go and, and what life is going to look like moving forward. Maybe you're just kind of trying to figure out where God wants you to be and what God wants to do in your life. But maybe you need the light of God's truth to shine into your life today because you need some hope. Because you've got circumstances that are surrounding you. you you've got darkness surrounding you and it, it, seems, it seems hopeless. And it doesn't seem like there is any way out. Maybe you need the light of the truth of God's word to shine into that and bring you hope. I don't know where you are today, but wherever we are, we all have some area of our life right now that we need the light of God's truth to shine into and that we need to be reminded of what Jesus came to this earth to do and who Jesus is and what the celebration of his birth is all about. Because the celebration of the birth of Christ is all about God pursuing you and pursuing me to reconcile us into a relationship with him pursuing what was lost and redeeming what had been lost in the garden when Adam and Eve fell. So wherever you're at today, I pray that you would surrender to God whatever area of your life you need the light of his word to shine into. Let's all stand. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you so much for the fact that your word is a light that shines into our lives and it shows us, God, not only who we are, but it shows us where to go. 
shows us how to get there and who you want us to be. But God, it gives us hope. And right now, we live in a culture and in a world that desperately needs some hope. Because God, there's so many things right now that are trying to steal hope from us. That are trying to rob us of the hope that we can have in you. And God, when we place our faith and trust in you and when we look to you, it doesn't matter if there's a pandemic. It doesn't matter what happens in our nation. It doesn't matter what happens in our our community or even in, in our homes. But God, all that matters is that you are the hope that anchors our soul. God, if we'll place our faith and our trust in that hope, God, that you can shine the light of your truth into that situation. And God, right now, I just pray that we'll respond today as you have spoken to our hearts. Because God, we all have some area of our lives that we need the light of your truth to shine into, to impact the darkness that we find ourselves in. And so God, I pray today that you would break through our darkness wherever we are. And God, that you would bring us to where you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all worship together. so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know the safe of the Lord so Jesus Jesus how I trust Him, how I've proved Him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. say, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him all.